Well, good evening, and thank you for joining me on this Friday evening as we complete uh, this little book, Green Leaf in Drought. And um, I just want to read you the little paragraph that Wilda says as she arrived in Hong Kong. I mean, we can only guess what it meant traveling by lorry and over many, many miles. It must have been quite a stress. But she says, it is almost impossible to express one's feeling of relief, joy, and happy gratefulness. Truly, the goodness and the mercy of the Lord had followed us all the way and made many crooked places straight. Many times, one day by truck and the rest by train, we had seen the Lord definitely working for us and how we praise him. The enemy was allowed to tease and tempt with specious promises, thrust out, clutch back, but only until God touched his hand. When God said, enough, his fingers fell open and the prey was delivered. Delivered as he has promised, way back in the words of Isaiah 49, 25, when he said that he would deliver them out of the enemy's hand. And now that Wilda had joined the rest, as it were, so to speak, on the shores of Malta, that sort of image of the ship that broke up, and Paul, of course, you know, they all went there. She says they anxiously, they anxiously watched the last two distant specks as they bobbed up and down in the thrashing surf of the storm. Well, Arthur's first reaction after his loved ones had left had been just a sense of intense relief that they would soon be out, as we've said. But soon his own needs, of course, looked him in the face. Would they allow Rupert to send him any money? His supply was almost gone. Then he knew God takes care of Mother Hubbard's cupboard, and that still continued. You can imagine his feelings when he opened that simple Chinese envelope and found one million dollars inside. Well, 45 US dollars, that is. Then there was a clothes parcel, and he said, Did I tell you that clothes, the clothes Wilda and Isla left, together with those in recent parcels, have proved to be so productive a supply? I've been able to trade them for food, and the score to date is over 200 eggs, four hens, and bowls of milk galore. I feel happier now about the tax which I had to pay on the Hong Kong and Switzerland parcels. He had to pay 180% duty on them. But the weather was now getting warmer, and there were lots of flies and insects and the diseases which they bring. He began to be troubled again with a bad tooth and rheumatic pain in the back and shoulders, doubtless due to it. Both men longed to be together, as letters which came out to those watching on the shore indicated. Arthur writes, I am seriously thinking of sending in an application for a pass just to go to sinning for a few days in order to get dentistry done. The hygiene department here won't pull it, so no one on the street dare attempt it. It will give them added delight just to hear that I'm suffering and still more to refuse the pass. Unfortunately, I cannot deal with the more or less gentlemen in sinning and have to do it all through the scruffy local specimens. And then in addition to this, he got stomach trouble. As he lay there for five days sick in bed, he wondered if this was not God's provision to have Dr. Clark sent to him. He could not know, of course, at that very time that Rupert Clark was also on a sick, in sick bed in sinning, wondering, perhaps this will make them send Arthur to take care of me. <laughs> but far away on the home coast, Wilda and the other prayer watchers received the news, each man sick in his station, each praying for the other to come, and then silence for a while. How anxious were the prayers that went up. Would these two weakly bobbing heads on the surf be really engulfed? It was like Horatius swimming in the Tiber, saying, off they thought him sinking, but just as oft he rose. One moment it seemed hopeless, the next they reappeared, clinging as it were to some part of the ship. Arthur writes, very pleasant change in application at this end. Rupert was able to send me post office money order, so I'll be able to draw my share without having to see Felix at all. All the same, the granting of another month's money has always those hope-shattering effects. I felt worse last night. But this morning, Jeremiah came to my rescue again in chapter 9, verse 2, where the commentary says, He sighed for release 
but he stayed. The moan of his soul increased the worth of his loyalty to his task. When the hope-shattering money allowances came each month, did the best wine stop flowing? We know that that is just the time when it gets richer and sweeter, although only the person who drinks it might know that. Arthur says, One of our most precious verses is Psalm 34, 4, where I read, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Wow, what a verse. The determination to keep us on would cause another fear if we did not flee to the above verse continually. Our balance now stands at 860,000, which leaves enough to hold us about two more months, I think. Beyond that, I refuse to think. It looks as though we're in in for a bit of personal attention along the way. Please pray about guidance for Rupert. This last referred to the rumours of a public trial on the charge of murder for each of them. They did not know the charge until almost the last moment, and now they have to go through Lancho on their way out. Lancho was the place where Dr. Clark ministered in his hospital, and the station there where Arthur and Wilda worked was the same, was close by. It was also where Mrs. Kale claimed property and where Arthur's public trial threatened. These public trials were dreadful things, where the populace were told lies and urged to a frenzy that called for execution of the accused. So the praying friends at home watched this new monstrous way of tearing down over the sea towards these little specks on the surface. They continually prayed that it would break before it reached them. Another month slowly passed, and during it Arthur had a different kind of trial. And this is what he writes. June the 14th, interestingly, that is Sunday of this week, 1953, of course. The devil seems to be centering his attention on Wilda's mail. I know that she's writing every three or four days, but the numbered letters that come are not consecutive, and there have been sad gaps. When you don't feel too well and have to potter around and keep wondering whether the medical book is right or wrong in the guidance, the days do, gl- do drag. On Saturday I read Luke twenty-two thirty-seven. The things concerning me have an end, and it has been growing a growing seed of comfort in my mind since then. You will know that I'm not trying to fix any time limit. We've learned that it, it's not given us to know, so we just rest there. We had a letter recently suggesting that a certain husband was allowed through the Iron Curtain because of his wife's petition, so our wives should be given the hint. This, of course, demanded an answer, and I wanted clear assurance. The next morning in my quiet time, I read Psalm 52, verse 9. It said, I will wait on your name. And the Lord spoke clearly to me from Matthew Henry's Henry's commentary on this verse. He says, There is nothing better to calm our spirits and to keep us in the way of duty when we are tempted to an indirect course of action for our relief than to hope and quietly wait for salvation from the Lord. Well, that just put everything in place, and I said, that's okay. I remember Hudson Taylor's remark, which said, I have never seen the willingness to suffer and leave God to vindicate his own cause, his own people and their right where the result has not been beneficial, if there had been rest and faith in him. What a wonderful piece of wisdom that is, just to rest in the Lord and not panic. And this is a wonderful instance of the secret guidance of the Lord. That growing seed of comfort, the things concerning me have an end, was not a false hope. In less than one month, Arthur was to be on his way out, hardly believing it was real. And in one month and one week from the day God gave that seed of promise, He would have reached the end of his testing. He was to be in Hong Kong and free. And to quote his account of how it came. Early one morning, I'd gone out into the yard to water my few vegetables. The only thoughts in my mind were that the parsnips were doing well and soon I would have some fresh lettuce. So you can imagine my surprise when I looked up and saw a policeman. And the increased surprise when he told me to pack and be ready to leave in one hour. No, no other missionary exit from the communist China had been like this as far as I know, because the usual routine was to be called on some 
respectable hour of the day, told to get ready, but then have to wait weeks and months in irritating suspense before you were finally allowed to go. So I ran back to the house. I lit the fire, snatched my breakfast in between bursts of running up and down the stairs with things to pack. He took advantage of the officer's absence for a few minutes to quickly swing all the remaining foodstuffs and fuel into Ben's kitchen. He also gave Ben a lot of money that he had left. He said, I'm going home and you will soon be left, but I'm going to tell the Christians at home to pray for you. Well, you can imagine Ben's emotion, but when word came to send on Arthur's luggage to a certain spot, the police officer appeared and led him out after it. This is what he says. Later, sitting in the front seat, luxury of luxuries in China, of the police vehicle, I said to myself, this must be the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous. From that first consciousness of the Lord's intervention on my behalf, there was no turning back. The initiative was snatched away from my captors, and it seemed that every attempt to brew up another trouble was met by God. Hitherto you have come, but no farther, and here shall the proud waves be stopped. He arrived in sinning about noon, and the first thing was to examine his belongings. They took all his papers, his Bible, his passport, even the wrapping of his razor blades. And then he was led into the prison for the noonday meal and left there. Sometime in the afternoon he was summoned, and as he was being conducted to the law court, he saw Rupert Clark having his things examined. His heart leapt, as you can imagine. Arthur gave the foreigner's cough, <clears throat> saw Rupert glance up and give notice, but they dare not exchange looks beyond that. They were now seated before the judge, secretaries ready to write down what was spoken. Sentry behind Arthur, and the judge read out the accusations. Charge number one, collaboration in the murder of Dr. Keogh in 1936. Arthur looked him straight in the eye and said, In 1936, I was a student at the Melbourne Bible Institute. I didn't come to China until 1938. Oh, said the judge. Well, when were you here? Uh, well, not until 1948. Hmm. Charge two, called out the judge. Uh, it read, Arthur, Matthew, Arthur Matthews accused a girl to the KMT of being a communist, as a result of which she was tortured and maimed for life. Pure concoction of Mrs. Kao. Charge three, in your journey through China from Chefu at Tingsteo, Xi'an to Lancho, you have spread sedition. He was only a new language student then, and about six months of study nonetheless, and he had only stayed three or four days in each place. Charge four, through photography and letter writing, you have proved that you're an imperialist. Comments, Arthur, well, if you're cross-eyed enough to see the two together... Charge five, you have seized someone else's property. Well, the CIM had paid for many of the buildings on Dr. Keogh's compound, so naturally he had sent the Matthews family to live in one of them while they were working. This charge, Arthur insisted, was not his responsibility, but the mission's. The judge then tried to bluff and threaten Arthur into sign, signing a confession of these crimes, but he refused. Just put your name here, he said and then you will proceed immediately to join your wife and child in America. Possibly their reason for separating the little, little family in the first place. Arthur said, I stand before God and before you. I deny all these charges. I will not sign. Well then, we wash our hands of you, said the judge. We're going to send you to Lancho and let the people decide what to do with you. That means a public trial. Arthur was then taken out to a small room where Rupert Clark was under guard. They were put in the back seat of a jeep, but told not to speak. Arriving there, they were put in separate cells in the prison, and the lights were kept on all night, and Arthur had other prisoners with him. He looked around, and here was this code of personal hygiene. Wash your hands and face once a day. Wash your clothes frequently. Wash your body frequently. But the walls were splattered with the corpses of bed bugs. That was the previous tenants. The next morning, Rupert Clark, with two Roman Catholic priests, was taken to the Civic Forum with Arthur sent to a little room across the courtyard. And by the loudspeaker, you could hear their crimes being read out. He naturally concluded that they were to be deported and to be kept behind. 
Then, to his surprise, a police officer came running across the yard with a paper in hand. Arriving in front of Arthur, he read the previously five recorded charges, except that the first one had been changed to in league with the murder of Dr. Keo in 1948. Well, Keo had been gone 12 years by then, of course. The policeman shouted out Arthur's sentence, everlasting deportation, to be put into immediate effect. Arthur was rushed into the courtyard where the photographers were waiting. Cameras clicked on all sides. He, in his ragged clothes, marched into the police vehicle where Dr. Clark and the Roman Catholic priests were already seated. And these pictures, together with their accusations, would later be shown to the Chinese churches. That day, the truck took them to an inn in Lan Chau. All four of them had to sleep together in one Chinese bed. Arthur just wondered what was going to happen. The next morning they waited, but there was no summons to the public trial. By afternoon, suspense. Then there was a shadow of a policeman going across the courtyard. Then he came in and said, The time is now three o'clock. Your train will leave in one hour. Have your bedding ready to be taken on the truck. But I thought, said Arthur, you were going to have a special meeting. Arthur gave him a, Rupert gave him a quick dig and says, Would you keep quiet? The officer mumbled something and went out. The next morning, at Tens Yui, they were told the line must be repaired, so they spent three days in the railway prison. But the guards were pleasant to them and even asked them what they could like to, would like to eat. Rupert boldly spoke up for sweet and sour pork, and they got it. Twice it was served to them. Of course, this was evidently for the propaganda because the Reds broadcasting that Americans drop germ bombs and gasoline bombs in defenseless villages. They bury people alive, but we, we even treat our criminals in such a kind way. And from there they went by train to Hong Kong, and lying in his bunk that first night, in which the train had bypassed all the trouble centres, Arthur's relief was too great to sleep. And this is what he writes, and I'm going to finish with this for this book today. I fear that the Lord would allow even a Britisher a tear or two at the wonder of it all. Not having my Bible could not rob me of the comforts of Isaiah 31, 4 and 5. And this is what it says, and I read it of its translation. For thus has the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on its prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor lower himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down and fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it and passing over, he will preserve it. That night, lying in my sleeper, tears flowing on and off all night as I meditated on the little hovering mother bird, the feather curtain of God, the lion roaring and fighting for his beloved Mount Zion, and the eagle, as the eagle stirs up her nest, so the Lord alone did lead him. Omnipotence could have swept away the enemy threats and oppression overwhelmingly, and we would have been satisfied. But how much more precious were the exquisitely tender ministrations of God as our little mother bird? How much more as an adjective that fits better than anything else, are how much more God. Not only were the threats and accusations against us swept aside, but we were also given to see extra mercies that might be called the exaggerations of love. First-class food, sleeping accommodations, all the way to Hong Kong, in accommodation arranged, an afternoon in a cool tea shop while waiting for a connection, a vehicle to ourselves from Sinning to Lancho. No luggage worries, no booking of reservations or standing in line for tickets, no responsibilities. The only disagreeable thing was that we were under guard all the way. We were not allowed to exercise and 13 hours of sitting on wooden slat seats can be tiring. It was funny to watch us all jump to our feet every time the train stopped, just to stretch our muscles. But I am sure that all the other exit groups will go green with envy at our good fortune in being deported. As you can imagine, messages fired all over the world 
to tell the news of what had happened. There is a little, a little extra bit here, and if you have time to wait, you can turn it off. I don't mind, but I want to tell you it because I think this story is worth being told. And as the little reflection on this, and we're, I suppose we're reflecting on the whole of the last two weeks, it is clear to us how the Lord's purpose in deliberately bringing his servants into the net was that they might live their message before the eyes of the weak and the frightened little church. What you are speaks so loudly that I can't hear what you say. All right, the Lord seems to say, then I will seal their lips, I will forbid their preaching, and I will increase their drought until it's drier than that of the Chinese Christians. Then through their lives, I will prove that green leaves are still possible. We can see now, looking back, oh, this is a long time ago now, isn't it? But God is the same. And it may well be that you're in a place of drought, just like this. And you're struggling and wondering. It could be illness. It could be relationships. It could be some restraint on your life. I'm not sure. We all know the things we're living with. I have my own story as well, haven't I? How I respond in this, in the light in God, is going to determine whether I will produce something green or whether I will just wither away. And my prayer is that you and I will both so respond to God and his gracious dealings with us in every situation that we will always produce the fruit that we can and the world may know that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. So, Thank you for your patience and listening. Thank you for joining these nights. And as I said, next week, well, we're going on holidays. So I look forward to spending that time with you. And I'll share that with you. But that's a little surprise. Mm -hmm.